CityCast from Explicity. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Yano, and, and I just wrote my, my 12th book, which is called Life Through the Eyes of a Jazz Journalist, My Jazz Memoirs. I've been very fortunate to see so many great musicians perform through the years because I actually discovered jazz about 1970. So I've had about 50 years of watching the music and have been extremely lucky to see so much. One of the first major concerts I saw was in 1972 at the Hollywood Bowl. And imagine, I probably spent no two or three dollars maybe to get in to see this. It was an all day event and it featured six different groups. I got to see Ella Fitzgerald, who was still in, in the peak of her powers in 1972, the Count Basie Orchestra, Cannonball Adderley, Stan Kenton, Stan Getz, and Oscar Peterson. Each of them had separate sets and uh, Oscar Peterson actually stole the show by playing solo piano. And then without exaggeration, after every song he played, he got a standing ovation. So he must've gotten about 12 standing ovations during that day. So after seeing that, I had basically had to become a jazz fanatic for life. Uh, that same year, I was lucky enough to also to see the, a group called the Giants of Jazz, which was a, an all-star group that had Dizzy Gillespie, a Kai Winding on trombone, Sonny Stitt on saxophone, and uh, normally it had Thelonious Monk on piano, but unfortunately he wasn't on that tour. Uh, Roland Hanna was in his place. Al McKibben bass, and, uh, and it was Max Roach on drums. Normally it was Art Blakey, but Max Roach was an, an even trade, I think. So those were some of the early events that I got to see, and that was before I began writing about jazz. I've been writing about jazz since, well, I, my first reviews were in 1974, and by 1977, I was pretty much doing it all the time. I wasn't able to make a living from it for about 10 years because I, I had other jobs, but it finally it got to the point in time when I, I deci decided by the late 80s that I'm going to have to sink or swim with jazz, really, because it's it was it's taking up too much time. It, it's too much of a distraction. I, don't, I just don't have time to work. So, so I, I always say that I haven't worked since. Even though, of course, you know, I'm writing for all these different magazines and doing different assignments, so it is technically work, but it's always fun, basically. So I really have no complaints about my life, and and I hope that I my optimism and uh, joy at, at living it is reflected throughout the book. My guest today is Scott Yano, one of the best known and most prolific of jazz writers. Writing about jazz is special because of the dynamic and fluid nature of the music itself. There is a basic melody in jazz, but only to begin with. Then the musicians in their solos interpret that melody and the underlying harmonic structures. And always and without exception, that interpretation is different every time a jazz soloist plays the tune. Here's an analogy for jazz beginners. Uh, take classical music. Classical music is like a play. The lines are written for the actors, who must then use their skill to bring out the drama in the lines. But it is always the same lines, the same words. Jazz is more like scintillating conversation. You don't say the same thing twice. For the sake of your friends, I hope you don't. And how interesting you are depends on how much you know and how well you say it. So you see what I mean when I say that writing about jazz merits a special skill. And speaking of special skill, Scott Yano has authored 12 books, written over 20,000 recording reviews, and written over 900 liner notes. Liner notes are those little descriptive things that you see accompanying an album. He has also written artist biographies, and most easily accessible, he has written hundreds of summaries that you can read on uh, jazzonthetube.com. Scott doesn't tire easily, and simply listening to him describe a typical day is enough to make most of us long for the weekend. As I said earlier, it's all about how much you know and how well you say it. Scott Yano knows a lot, 
and says it in an unpretentious, direct and honest writing style. And now let's talk to him. Here he is, coming to us from his home near Los Angeles. Scott Yano, welcome to the Literary City. Well, thank you for having me. In the introduction, you mentioned spending just $2 to go to your first concert. What an incredible return on investment. No, no, I've been very lucky. And, you know, uh, you know, it's really uh, priceless today. Oh, most definitely. To begin with, what does a jazz reviewer's day look like? What do you do? Of course, no day is too typical, except for the fact that I almost every day I listen to the six or seven hours worth of music. If I'm able to, you know, as long I'm, as long as I don't have to go shopping or go go and do normal chores, if I could sit here, I'm listening to music all the time. So yesterday, uh, oh, I transcribed an interview that I'm, that I did with a, a saxophonist, just a, for a biography. And uh, I reviewed three records for the Los Angeles jazz scene. And uh, oh, I watched part of a film that I'm going to review too. So that yeah, was a normal day. A normal day? That sounds like a full day at the office. I know. To speak about musical criticism, there are some who say that a music critic shouldn't be a music critic unless they can play a musical instrument. And you responded by saying that that is usually from musicians who are pissed off because they didn't get a good review. <laughs> Why do jazz reviewers need to play? I mean, sports writers don't necessarily play at a competitive level, do they? Oh, yeah. Well, like I said, I, usually it's after a, a musician gets a bad review and, oh, you know, these critics, they don't know what they're talking about. And then, you know, they tend to act like all the critics are the same when in fact we're all different. I mean, I'm, I'm only responsible for the mistakes I made. You know, not for a review in 1957 that somebody else did. You know, <laughs> with, and, and, you know, be surprised. Uh, a, a lot of times, a lot of times writers do play a little bit of music. You know, I, I have, I have said that, you know, they're not frustrated musicians. They're frustrating musicians. If you listen to them. <laughs> Maybe in other disciplines too, but definitely in jazz, I've noticed that there are two distinct groups of people. One, musicians. I include myself there. And the other, aficionados. You know, they know the history of jazz, who played on which album and so on. And very often, one knows very little about the other. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose that is? Yeah, well, I mean, for, for a jazz critic, jazz journalist, you know, if, if you play music, that, that's good because it, it means you have more knowledge. And I play a little bit. I play a little bit of saxophone, tenor sax and clarinet and a melodica, which is, you know, I always say I'm the world's best because I'm the world's only one. <laughs> How many people play bebop and melodica? But, what uh, about John Batiste? Yeah, I know, but he's just dancing around with it. <laughs> <laughs> See, the key to playing melodica is to play single note lines. You don't play chords. Because if you play chords, it sounds like an accordion or it sounds like a... a uh, in an inferior harmonica, but if you play single note lines and pretend you're a saxophonist or a trumpeter, you, you some you could get away with it for a few minutes. <laughs> Hilariously, in your book, you talked about how you first started to play the accordion, and that made you a good right-handed jazz musician because the left hand was just pushing buttons. Yeah, it, it was it, one of the big musical mistakes of my life. But you really shouldn't let a, a six-year-old come up with, you know, make major decisions like that because. Because I, I played accordion for a year, and then my parents asked, "Well, would you would you like to have organ lessons instead?" And I said, "No, I li no, I like playing accordion. Bad mistake." <laughs> and so, yeah. So now I'm a one-handed piano player. I could I could play real good lines, but there's no great demand for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't stop you from writing, though. Speaking of which, your writing output is phenomenal. So, how do you do it? Well, we just do it every day. That's it, really. You just uh, you know, you become a more of a professional writer by just doing it constantly. Really, I mean, in my spare time, I listen to records. So, you know, that's my spare time. And then my work time, I'm listening to records. So it, it doesn't really stop. <laughs> so, you know, it's just it's just a matter of, a, you know, when you write, there, there are certain things I follow. I, I try not to use the word I much at all. And I, you have to, it, it's always good to proofread it one more time and make sure you're not repeating the same phrases too much, those kind of things. But basically, the, the idea is just to describe the music if you can. And, you know, what does the music sound like? Uh, what's on the CD? Because quite often, you know, I read reviews and they don't even tell you who the personnel is, you know, and, and it might be a quartet record and they don't tell you who two, two of the people are. I just read a review like that this morning. And, you know, and also keeping in mind your audience, you know, the audience basically for me are jazz fans. 
or people that are just getting into the music or have been into it for a while, it's not really musicians and it's not other critics, even though even though musicians do sometimes read the reviews. And of course, I'm a great writer if I write something nice about them. I submit. Jazz is a very technical form of music, but how technical does a jazz reviewer need to be? If you're too technical, you'll wind up alienating the audience, right? You know, if you read, if you look at my stuff, I try to keep it fairly simple. I mean, I don't want I don't want readers to have to use the dictionary to figure out what I'm saying. And there are writers sometimes who they use too many big words, and I don't know what they're talking about. Even I, all I want to know is. Is the record any good? And, you know, what does it sound like? That That's that's what, as a jazz fan, that's the main thing you're curious about. But, I, you know, I, I try to keep them in mind. So I'm not, I'm not trying to impress any writers or, or writing a PhD or anything like that. You know, I, I just want to keep it simple. Still, you need to be very clued in. Now, Downbeat magazine used to have uh, something called the blind test, correct? Blindfold test. R- right, blindfold test. Well, how would you do on the Downbeat blindfold test? Well, it depends. You know, if it's if it's music before 1990, I'll do really well. If it's right, if it's right now, it's difficult because there are so many great musicians. I mean, I think right now, even though it doesn't get much publicity, I think there are more talented jazz musicians in the world at, at the moment than there ever have been. So there might be a great trombonist from Finland. I'm, I'm not going to know his name. And unfortunately, I'm not I, I won't recognize him. So I, I could be fooled easy. Now, now, if it's if, if it's fairly well known musicians, I I would probably get it. And like I say, if it's historic people, for sure I'll get it because I study that. You know. Now, if you had the chance to interview someone historic in jazz, who would it be? But it would be fun to hang out with Louis Armstrong, and you know, it'd be fun to, to ask Charlie Parker questions, people like that, of course. You know, it's commonly agreed that Charlie Parker created the new grammar of jazz, which is bebop. But I have a two-part question. You mentioned so many new and great musicians coming up. How do you keep track of all of them? And second, how do you keep track of what they do? Has there been a new Charlie Parker, a new seminal trend in jazz? Well, you see, it's really tricky, you know, because the, the situation's changed because, say, before 1980 or so, there were maybe five or six major record labels, and all you have to do is follow the releases that were coming out, and right. they would be influential, you know, if a Blue Mitchell came out with a record or Joe Henderson or someone like that, you know, that, that would have an effect. Everybody heard it. But now, because record labels, are, are, you know, either don't exist or they're, they're basically a one person operations, you know, people are doing their own. There's thousands of things going on at once. And, you, and so that means that the, no one particular thing is, is having such a major influence that it's changing the music. The music's evolving and it's moving forward, but it's moving forward in, uh, in infinite number of directions at once. It isn't like you have a John Coltrane who you know, everybody's follow, uh, a large number of people are following. So it's hard to say. I mean, the music of 2022 is different than the music of 2012, but he, but. For a variety of reasons, it's hard to tell that. You know, one reason is that there isn't any, na- there aren't any names for new styles. You, know, you don't have any bebop or vanguard or yeah, ever since ever since fusion. I think that was the last one that really had a name. So, you know, what do you call Pat Metheny's music? You know, right. it's modern jazz, or you know, then you try to describe it. Well, someone's music is contemporary jazz, and which is nice, but it doesn't mean that much because 20 years from now it won't be contemporary you know so, not anymore quite right so so, so I, it's hard to say it's like there's so many great talents but but there's there aren't any one or two that are just so influential that it's changing the music right now mm-hmm. well cycling back to the business of writing sports writers frequently ghost for major sports stars have you ever ghost written for anyone Oh, well, not too much, but I, I did have one experience that with Clint Eastwood. Now, th- this is kind of funny. I write about it in the book. Is sometime in the early 80s, Horace Silver came out with a record on Columbia. Uh, I forget the name, but uh, they wanted Clint Eastwood to write the liner notes. But because he was a friend of his, he, he, he'd known him a bit through the years. He didn't have time, though, so the record label asked me to write the notes. So I came up with it. I spent all day and a half put together some pretty good notes, you know, talking about how great Horace Silver was through history and stuff. And then when I sent it in, they said, oh, no, this is we can't use this because Clint wouldn't know most of this stuff. You know, why don't you keep it simple? So I spent 
I spent you know 15 minutes put together put together line lots of oh uh, Horace Silver is a, it's good to see that Horace Silver my old pal is has a new record out and I'm going to enjoy it and stuff and they thought it was great. <laughs> what an interesting story. Now, but that's a good segue to my next question. Your book, uh, Jazz on Film, is that book like the IMDb of jazz movies? Well, well, basically, I wanted that book to list every performance of a jazz musician that was on film, particularly in Hollywood movies, because there's a lot of films where you you might see a jazz musician for half a minute on film, and then then it's not even listed sometimes in the credits. And you wonder who was that? Who was the piano player on this particular cut? It's not so much whether on the, you're on the soundtrack or not, but it's whether they actually appear on the film. And it, and it was a good excuse to spend a year watching movies again. <laughs> what a nice job. <laughs> to talk some more about writing, I'd like to talk about lyrics. Take, for example, Annie Ross's Twisted. Great, great writing, great stuff. But yet, even though jazz writers are very often first-rate wordsmiths, you guys pay very little attention to the literature of the lyrics. Why is that? Oh, I don't know. You know, it, it really depends on the taste of the, the writers. I mean, a lot of them ju are just not into vocalists, or they think that, uh, or they have the uh, the feeling that, well, if a singer goes on stage and they're kind of average, they'll get tremendous applause while there'll be a great trumpeter behind them playing all kinds of impossible things, and he'll be ignored altogether. <laughs> but but I don't feel that way. I mean, singers are part of the singers are part of the heritage, and they're part of the music. You know, I mean, I did write a book on jazz singers, and yes, I read it. Some of them, are, some of them are great. You know, there's an awful lot of very good female singers around today. A lot, you know, I mean, people always make jokes about, you know, female jazz singers not being, not knowing where they are, what key or anything like that. But that's really not true. I mean, the professionals know what they're doing. Oh, yes, I know those jokes. Now, your latest book, Through the Eyes of a Jazz Journalist, is an autobiography. And it has so many interesting anecdotes. I like that one about the call that you got from Horace Silver. Oh, yeah, well, I pick up the phone and he says, hi, this is Horace Silver. And I said, hi, this is the Queen of England. <laughs> Elizabeth of Greenpoint, Brooklyn. <laughs> well, you don't expect to hear from people like that. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's like he's royalty. So, And that other interesting anecdote about Charlie Watts of the Rolling Stones, who was a jazz drummer at heart, wasn't he? Well, well you know, uh, Charlie Watts, for every once in a while, he would put together a jazz group and he would tour. So in this case, he had a quartet with, uh, I think, Pete King on alto. And it, it was playing bebop, but it, it was kind of a funny thing because most of the people in the audience were just there to see this Rolling Stone drummer. I'd and, he, and, he, and all he wants to do is play in the background and, you know, just help the music swing. So every time he would take like a four-bar drum break, it'd be a gigantic applause. <laughs> <laughs> yes, other musicians love drummers for this reason. The thing kind of happens when Woody Allen plays, you know. It, it, right, I was going to ask you about Woody Allen. He's an okay clarinetist, but, but you know, you'd think he was the best ever because the, the audience just goes crazy every time he plays a couple of notes. <laughs> <laughs> as, as can be expected. Now, in your autobiography, there are, as there should be, some interesting personal references. But I was tickled by this one line. It goes, I always liked the fact that Bird was located on Boyd Street. Uh, I know this to be a reference to the Brooklyn accent that you grew up with. Uh, Boyds and bees, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's definitely true. But even though people poked fun at the way you spoke, you decided to wear it on your sleeve, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Well, I like to do the opposite of what people expect. So, you know, I move out to California. And, and in California, because people on TV, on television, talk like they do in Los Angeles, they think they don't have an accent. So you come up with a, you come up with a New York accent, you know, after sixth grade and... People made fun of my accent, so I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll keep it. <laughs> well, well, in India, we understand accents very well. We have many. Well, about half my listeners are from India. So I, I, let me ask you this question. Did you know that jazz had a profound effect on the development of Bollywood music? No, no, I'm glad it has, but no, I didn't know. There's a wonderful documentary. It's called Finding Carlton, and it examines this relationship great piece of jazz history. I'll, I'll send you the details and I'll even introduce you to the guy who made the film. Yeah. And there's quite a bit of that history going back. Uh, you must have heard of Teddy Weatherford. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know he played in Calcutta and, you know, he was from 
from probably from New York originally, but he spent most of his time overseas. He was a great player. For our listeners, Life Through the Eyes of a Jazz Journalist, My Jazz Memoirs by Scordiano is a fascinating read, and there is a link to where you can buy it in the podcast description. All right, and on to my final question, Scott, what's next for you? Oh, I don't know, probably lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's like when someone asked Buddy Rich once, so where's jazz going? And he says, well, next week I'll be in Toledo. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. But you, you have plans for another book, don't you? Yeah, I, I, have, I have like two or three different ideas, one, you know, one of which I'll decide upon. And, uh, you know, I, have, I haven't definitely decided upon it yet, but it, it'll be more of a, a history book again, like a lot of my other books where it, it fo focuses on a, an instrument or a period of time. But, uh, you know, I try to make each of the books somewhat entertaining. And uh, and in addition to being educational, you know, the, the main goal really is just to help jazz become more popular and, and to help lead record collectors into discovering people they haven't heard before, you know, and that they hopefully they'll enjoy. Right. And what would be your recommendation for people who are just getting into jazz listening? What should they listen to first? I, I would recommend certain people rather than rather than albums. You know, to me, if you're going to uh, explore the, the history of jazz, the early days, uh, there are always six six logical names that you know I think completely changed the music, and they had their own musical world. So I would I would you know look into Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, and John Coltrane. If you start with those six, you'll it'll lead you to almost everybody else. I mean, there's all kinds of amazing people from the past. If you listen to Art Tatum play solo piano, it's I mean, how how could anybody even play like that? You know, much much less you know be able to improvise and have your own sound. And then if people want to get into more electric jazz, well, Weather Report and Return to Forever. If they're coming from rock, from rock music, those would be the the gateway ones. But around today, I mean, there's, there are just so many. I, I would listen to someone like, say, Terrence, trumpeter Terrence Blanchard. And, you know, just his body of work is pretty pretty strong. I'd listen to, if you want swinging piano player, piano uh, music, maybe someone like Benny Green, the piano player. And uh, But but there, there are so many. So if you explore those names and, and then maybe go out and get recordings by the sidemen or the people that they played with, it'll lead you to so many others. I mean, you could spend a lifetime just listening to Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, you know. There, there's so many rewarding re recordings. But of course, you want to you want to have people that are around today, too. So, you know, those are good ones to start with. Useful advice. Now, your closing thoughts on writing jazz? Uh, I'd just like to close by saying, you know, writing about jazz is, is, is fun. You know, and if you have, if you run across critics who, take themselves too seriously well it kind of reflects themselves in the writing but when you write about jazz you just have to remember that the, the heroes and the, the creators are the musicians and that's that's really the focus because you know there's some of the most creative and brilliant musicians in the world who play jazz and it's just a pleasure to be able to hear all that music and introduce it to people well, that's a very nice thing to say but over the years you've opened doors for a lot of musicians i'm sure they're grateful Oh. There we have it. Scott Gano, thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. And that was Scott Gano, one of the best-known jazz writers there is. And I'll be back with that fun segment, What's That Word? Stay tuned. And here we are with What's That Word? where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. And to help me with it is my co-host, and as always, I will let her introduce herself. Hello, my name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. How's it going today? Hey, I loved that interview with Scott Yano. Fun, wasn't it? He's very experienced, clearly. Very. Had you heard of him before? Yes, I have. Uh, isn't he the one who wrote a review of Radha Thomas's recording? Yes, he's the one. Uh, her vocalist album. Where did you see it? Did you see it on Jazz and Bangalore group on Facebook? Yeah, that's where. Oh, okay. And anyway, Radha is the reason I'm obsessed with jazz. Huh? And of course, you and um, Aman Mahajan. 
Oh, that's nice of you to say. No, I'm happy to know you guys and go to your concerts. But how did you get into jazz? And also, more importantly, how did jazz get into you? <laughs> yeah, that second part of the question is the more relevant one. Well, anyway, many years ago when I was living in Delhi, I was teaching myself to play classical guitar. And I got along with that. But one day I heard Dizzy Gillespie playing A Night in Tunisia. And that was it. Something happened. Something went snap in my head. And that from that day onwards, all I have listened to is bebop. And all I have played on the guitar is bebop. And that's how jazz got into me. But, you know, there's also a funny story. That solo that Dizzy Gillespie has on A Night in Tunisia. And I was listening to it so much that I completely memorized it. And I was driving to work one day in Delhi. So it was at a long light, and this came on. The song came on on the on the cassette player, and I sort of decided to scat that solo along, <laughs> eyes closed, you know, in bebop nirvana, and there I was going. When I finished, <laughs> I suddenly heard all the cars around me burst into applause. <laughs> I, was very, I was very embarrassed. But that's when I also <laughs> thought, hey, wait a minute, I could become a jazz musician too. <laughs> yeah. And scat is that thing vocalists do with random syllables for words, right? Completely correct. And how did scat happen? Oh, well, there are many stories to that. But the, uh, the very popular one is that Louis Armstrong forgot the words to a, to a song that he was singing on stage and then quickly made up some mouth noises instead, instead of the words. <laughs> That's interesting. Ah, yeah, it is. But, you know, progressively, that that scat has become a thing. And, you know, scat singing is, is a matter of skill now. And it's become fairly common for vocalists to scat as, as if they were an instrument. And you can scat. I can, but uh, uh, no, the answer is no. Not doing it. Hey, not even a line? No chance. Okay, enough with all that. Okay, P with an A, as I asked earlier, what's that word? Well, today, instead of etymology, I have a number of jazz-related things to talk about. Oh, yeah, cool. I can talk jazz. Shoot. First, what was that joke that you and Scott Yana were laughing about? <laughs> the one about singers? <laughs> yeah, okay. It goes like this. Why can you tell that it's a singer... That's scratching at the door. Why is the singer scratching at the door? Because she cannot find her key and doesn't know how to come in. <laughs> You're in big trouble, man. Ew. <laughs> but let's spend the rest of our time doing jazz jokes. <laughs> cool. Why, do you have one? Yes. Okay, let's hear it. What do you call a jazz musician's girlfriend? What? A trust fund, babe. <laughs> I almost dated a musician once. Oh, then you'd know. Well, <laughs> jazz musicians are always broke. So, you know, you want to hear one? Here's my almost original. Yeah. What's the difference between a pizza and a jazz musician? What? The pizza has dough. <laughs> Why almost original? Well, the original is a pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> Oh, that's rude. Not half as rude as some other jokes, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, on to a little etymology, actually. Okay, P with an A. For the third time, what's that word? Jazz. Ah, all right, jazz. Uh, here, okay, the short version. The word, you know, the jazz, the word itself is actually from the, from the uh, middle to late 1800s. And it was a slang word. And the original form of that word was jasm, J-A-S-M. And jasm simply meant energy, vitality, you know, spirit. And I'm not sure exactly where it was that slang, jasm. But by 1912, that word appeared as jazz in American English. And it first showed up as a baseball term, meaning lively or energetic and which pretty much is the same meaning. But by 1915, it also became the label to describe the genre of music that we're discussing today, jazz music. Eventually, jazz started to take on other slang, other meanings, including 
things like rubbish, unnecessary talking, or being ostentatious, or, you know, ornamentation per se. And in 1918 to 1920, the word became jazzy. That word came into play as uh, another form of this word which uh, indicates a certain flair or panache, which many years later turned mm. into <laughs> jazz hands, you know, jazz hands. And that's the etymology. Right. Interesting. And what do you call the blues? Jazz for children. <laughs> That's mean. All right, P with an A. That was fun. And let's do it again next week. And that is our show for today. Let's see you again next Wednesday. Bye. Bye.